and we got together a bunch of experts with using particular algorithms to make sure that we weren't kind of biasing our results by how well we knew the particular models. Um, and we, we, we basically ran out a bunch of algorithms that have been used and published um, to do to do this same thing. So we used a couple of implementations of artificial neural networks, meaning same approach but implemented by two different people, two different groups using two different bits of code, essentially. Uh, climate envelopes, uh, GAN metrics, classification trees, GARP, GIMS, GAMS. The details of them aren't important, but a range of different approaches that view the world, if you like, in very, very different ways. We then made predictions. These are two species of, of proteaceae. We made predictions under um, uh, current and future climate scenarios. Uh, it's actually a scenario for, for, for the 2030s. And then we calculated the predicted range gain or loss under those climate scenarios. Okay? So we basically um, we took a model um, that was um, thresholded, and we're going to talk about thresholding, but that is to say we have binary predictions of suitable and not suitable versus um, you know, a, a, a continuous probability surface or, or a suitability surface. And then we estimated um, uh, what the, um, uh, what the, if you like, um, the, the percentage of the present day range and, and the future day range. So we took two, two scenarios, one of which was um, we assumed full dispersal, meaning that any area that was occupied in the future um, was uh, predicted to be um, occupied. Whereas any, uh, we also did a, a no dispersal scenario where we said that the only areas that were going to be occupied in the future were those areas that kind of overlapped with the current distribution. So we were going to assume that if we were predicting to some other area within South Africa in the future, but the species wasn't currently present there, well, the species didn't have the opportunity to actually get there. I'm, I'm not going to go into any more details on that because Enrique is going to talk about these things within the context of applications later on. The only important point now is to say that we were able to quantify the predicted range gains and losses, so you only get a loss, of course, when you assume that, um, that there's, there's, there's no dispersal ability, okay, so you're going to get this loss when there's no dispersal ability. The only important point I want to emphasize now is that you get very, very different predictions from the different models. So this particular species, for one model, a, a, a GAM was predicting that this, this species could expand massively, 300% ex expansion in its range area under a future climate scenario, whereas using the same dispersal of the, um, uh, assumptions, we had other models for a, a, a GAL metric example that, uh, that predicted an almost complete contraction of that species range, an almost complete collapse of the suitable area that was available for that species. So hugely, hugely different results. And we did some cluster analyses that kind of grouped methods together, and it was interesting to see that some of the more complex algorithms um, ended up grouping with some of the more um, simple algorithms. So GARP, that um, is quite complex in many ways, um, groups gave very similar predictions to this very simple um, uh, climate envelope range. Um, the point I want to make here, and go and read the paper if you're interested in the details, is that the model predict the model selection can, doesn't always, but can, have a very big impact on your predictions. So you need to be very careful about selecting your models, justifying your models, and increasingly testing more than one model so that you can make um, uh, qualitative statements that aren't subjective, are, aren't, aren't dependent on the actual model that was predicted, uh, that, that, that was used. So ideally, if presenting the work to uh, in a thesis or, or, or to a government agency or, or to, a, um, a, to a publication, you want to be able to say that my conclusions aren't dependent on an arbitrary choice about which algorithm I use. So you need to have good justification for the algorithms that you've used, you need to understand how they're functioning, and you need to be able to say that my results or my conclusions, the, the result might not be exactly the same, but my conclusion, my, my recommendation, my conclusion is not dependent on the actual algorithm that's, that's used. I um, just want to emphasize this is a really um, key paper, an important paper. The lead author is, is, is Jane Enith. It's actually Jane Enith and Catherine Graham that led this paper in ecography in 2006. 
where they did, um, similar to what I've just discussed, they didn't look at climate change scenarios, they just looked at the um, um, kind of present day, if you like, they took a whole bunch of algorithms, they took a whole bunch of um, uh, data sets, um, and then ranked the models basically based on two axes of model performance. So we're going to talk about these, what these axes mean in detail um, tomorrow, but basically think lower performance to higher performance, and lower performance to higher performance, so your better models should be plotting up here, and your poorer models should be plotting down here. Okay? It's a really key paper, it's one that I'd recommend that you, you go away and look at. It's some neat things, for example, the um, data that was used to build the models was independently collected from the data that was used to evaluate the models. Um, um, so uh, what you see again is that the models don't all predict the same. There's some rankings in terms of which models are able to perform better. The general conclusion here was that models that are able to, to fit more complex responses, some of these new methods, boosted regression trees, MAPSEN, where you can fit these very complex response um, services are better able to predict niches and distributions than some of these more simple approaches such as Bioclin um, or Domain um, that, that and, and Enrique is going to talk through Bioclin um, in, in just a minute when, when I finally shut up. Um, but we are going to have some important caveats to that and I know Tam is going to expand on this in a, a, a little bit later to, today or tomorrow but there is, a, I think, a very valid and serious concern that these evaluation approaches and the way that this study was done and, and the majority of studies are done, in effect, reward overfitting. And we're going to detail that in more, um, in more context and, and, and with some more examples later on in, in, in the course. But I, I, I wanted to flag this as, as, a, as an important part of this field, an important study, but also an important caveat in terms of, of, of the potential that the, the results can be influenced by um, overfitting. So, so more on that to come. Um, a final thing that I wanted to mention, which is another important kind of um, area of, of, of research at the moment, but is this idea of consensus modeling or ensemble modeling. So this is to say, okay, so the models perform differently. How do we deal with that? And there's been some key work done, in particular by Miguel Arujo um, and, and, and colleagues that are saying, well, what we, what we should be doing is building a whole bunch of different models and then looking at patterns of consistency across those models. So um, conceptually, this is a, a neat paper. Again, I'll give you the reference in a moment. Suppose that, you know, this is, this is um, clearly a, a region of the world that we're, we're interested in, given, given where we are right now. Um, suppose these are the kind of uh, envelopes or, or, or the predictions from a whole range of different models. So this might be a Biogen model, a Maxent model, a neural network, a, um, a GART model, a boosted regression tree, etc. These are the predictions from a range of different models. Well, what the argument here is that uh, what we might do is look at some sort of um, consistency among them. So, so this area shown here in, in, in yellow, I hope you can see that, might be just those areas where all of the models predict. So this is a kind of consensus that, well, all of the models think that we should be predicting that this, this is a crucial area here in, in terms of the, the distribution and, and the niche of the species. And then we might say, well, this, this, this area in light blue here is the area where, well, say, half of the models predict, or at least half of the models predict. And then this area, the, the, the kind of broader prediction here might be kind of any model predict. This might be the area where, well, any of the models, if, if you look at across all of them, then at least one of the models predicts that this would be a suitable area. So this is the kind of way of it, trying to tackle this issue of model uncertainty and, and the different, different performance from different, different methods. This is, you might just look at this in a bit more, more complication. You might start saying, well, this is where all of my models predict. This is where our four out of five predict, where three out of five predict, two out of five, one out of five predict. So the, these kinds of ways of, of, of looking at predictions if you're predicting many, many different models. To take that to, to the full extreme, you might be able to predict enough different methods parameterized in different ways that you can actually build up uh, a full kind of probability surface so that you pick out those kind of core areas that most parameterizations and most models predict to, 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 to kind of lower probability areas. So this is an important stream or, or kind of strain in literature that, that we wanted to flag.
flag for you. It's work, um, I've um, uh, collaborated on, on, on trying to apply these approaches. It's not um, the be all and end all, like I say, it's not necessarily the, the overall solution. And I'm saying you should definitely be using consensus approaches. It's an important thing to read about and, and consider that, that, that you might want to do. I also think that another important way of looking at this is to say, well, I don't want to run um, 20 different methods to build up a, or 100 different methods to build up a probability surface, but I do want to run more than one method so I can look at the uncertainty in my, in my method. So, so um, what you should be able to go away from this week is with well, at least three different methods that you understand, that you can parameterize carefully, that you can go away and start running well, more than one method to look at, well, suppose I throw this other algorithm at it and, and, and then look at the uncertainty that comes from applying you know, more than one algorithm. So I'd strongly advise you to look at more than one algorithm this is an important approach. Some folks have referred to it as a kind of throw the kitchen sink at it. Let, let's just get all the approaches that we can and throw them in there and then look at, at consistency across them. Um, well, there's a balance between that versus selecting and very carefully understanding a smaller group of models and choosing models that you understand very well, that you very carefully parameterize, and you understand, therefore, what the predictions are, 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 are meaning. Okay. So there's a balance here, but we wanted to emphasize one model, mm, uncertainty, and more than one model gets better, and then there are, there are these approaches for consensus models that, that we'd encourage you to, to look at. That's all just by way of introduction, trying to give you some general considerations and some things to think about and, and read about, and there are just some of the key um, references that, that I'm referring to. So this, this is the, the South African study that basically says there can be big uncertainty from using different methods. Um, this is the Elith Gray Metal paper that I'd encourage you to have a look at, and we're going to hear a little bit more about later. And then here is the, the Miguel and, and Arujo and Mark News paper on, on ensemble forecasting, which is that there's, there's a growing literature on that, but I think that's a good kind of starting point to understand these, these kinds of consensus or, or ensemble approaches.